A uh, wonderful afternoon to all of you. Thank you for making your way down here um, for this talk. I think it's nice to see um, us having a physical art conversations. Uh, we were dabbling between having a Zoom uh, session or, or but I think we prefer a physical uh, experience. So my name is Mars. I'm from Maya Gallery. So um, this art conversation sessions that we're having is part of the Time and Space exhibition. Uh, I'm happy, happy that uh, some of you have already come to visit the show and uh, this is uh, uh, basically I will be uh, introducing to you the panel uh, for today. We will start with uh, uh, Dr. Lai Chikian, he's over there. Uh, he's a registered architect and uh, architectural and urban historian. So um, he researches on histories of art, architecture, settlements, urbanism and landscapes in Southeast Asia. He's also a writer, artist, designer, curator and traveller. Um, the next is uh, Prof Kwok Kian Wen. Uh, Prof Kwok is uh, an Associate Vice President uh, for Wellbeing at NTU. So his research, uh, his research interests include the study of social memory, mental health, civil society and heritage and the arts. Prof Kwok has served on the boards of uh, NHB um, and he's an external advisor to NAFA and he was President of the Singapore Heritage Society. Uh, next we have Mr. Tio Han Wee. So, uh, Mr. Tio has written art reviews for Straits Times and was editor of the bilingual section and head of translation. Uh, he was director at the National Arts Council in various capacities. And he was the director at Art Retreat as well, which was Singapore's first private museum of Asian and Southeast Asian art. And he has written extensively about uh, visual artists such as uh, Wu Guanchong, Lim Zepeng, Chua Ek and Tang Da Wu in English and Chinese for publications at home and abroad. Uh, next we have uh, Ms. Lee Xiao Se. She will be the moderator for this uh, dialogue session. So Lee Xiao Se, she is a, a, a mother, lawyer, editor and author of six children books and a leader of a ground up a book project to uh, SIR, which is Socially Inclusive Reads uh, with Love. And her first creative work published in Quarterly Literary Review Singapore sparked a love for writing and her first book, Si Ma Kuang and Jayan Ja, was selected as an IBBY Outstanding Book for Young People with Disabilities. And uh, Xiao Se has edited eight non-fiction books and four children's books. Um, next, we have Lee Hon Kit. So Hon Kit is one of the artists for this exhibition. Um, basically, Hon Kit uh, picked up his love for drawing at a young age, and he spent time doodling and drawing <laughs> whenever he could. Um, nurtured by loving parents who granted him unfettered access to comics. So his love for the medium grew. He soon developed the talent to draw comics on his own. So at 13, uh, he left Malaysia for Singapore after he successfully applied for the ASEAN scholarship. Um, after his studies at uh, Raffles Institution and RJC, so his love for art motivated him to pursue his interest at NUS um, in uh, architecture. And he continued to draw comics for comic publications and the Sunday Times. Um, his popular weekly comic series, Huntsman, continued for two seasons. And he won third prize in both uh, National Computing Board and Computime's digital art competitions. Uh, Honky is a founder of Visual Media Works and is sought after for projects that require the combination of his talents in both architectural design and visualization skills. Uh, next is Edmund Lowe, he's also uh, an artist in this exhibition. So Edmund uh, grew up in Topayo for more than 30 years until he got married and moved out to Farrah Park. Uh, he graduated from NUS in architecture and he currently works as a full-time architect in a small private practice. Uh, Edmund has always had interest in, in photography. He has been taking photographs as a hobby since the 1980s. So the photos, uh, the photography shown in this exhibition were captured around 1980s and right down to uh, just a few years ago. So depicting scenes of Kampong Glam, Chinatown and Farrah Park. Um, the photos not only document the built environment and neighbourhoods, but also the people who lived in these areas and their cultures. Uh, some of these areas no longer exist. The intangible characteristics associated with them will eventually cease. Um, next, we have uh, Jeffrey Wanli, as you know. He, 
He captures heritage and historical landmarks with ink and acrylic on canvas. He is fondly called Building Whisperer and uh, he has exhibited in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Korea and Vietnam. And uh, his collections can be found in uh, Singapore and foreign uh, government ministries, organisations and private uh, individuals. Uh, he has his uh, Master's of Project Management from QUT and uh, Bachelor of Architecture from NUS. Uh, he won the Best of Show Award at Sanikita by uh, Kamal Arts Gallery uh, and uh, Merit Award at the STB's uh, Sacer Sculptor Competition and is a recipient of the Mendaki Excellence Award and the Architecture Angulia Scholarship. Um, yeah, so basically we have covered uh, all everybody in the panel. Um, I will pass the mic to uh, Selsa. She will be moderating this uh, session. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Selsa here. Uh, it's been quite a crazy week. Uh, had two heart attacks this week. The first being that uh, we learned that the Leluho Singapore's Kampung Glam won the Singapore History Prize Award 2021. So I'm quite privileged uh, to be in the presence of our author, uh, Hidayah Amin. Uh, the book was also designed by Mas of Maya Gallery. And uh, I am the editor of the book, so I feel very... Uh, privileged to have worked on this and to be here and share with everyone. The second attack, heart, heart attack, of course, was that uh, we didn't expect this win. We were kind of the underdog. So uh, Hidayah had had a you know, crazy week and she was supposed to moderate this, uh, but uh, she's basking in her euphoria now. So Mas told me, hey, can you come and co-moderate and help out? And I said, okay, given the Gotong Royong spirit, you know, in the commune, um, I'm happy to step up and to help out uh, since I was also part of the, uh, I've also grown with Maya Gallery. So I'm really happy to be here uh, in the new gallery. This is the first time I've been here, but I've been with uh, Maya Gallery for quite a long time. So it is quite apt that we see this exhibition, you know, called Time and Space because we are currently in unprecedented times. And the uh, concept of space is something that perhaps we had taken for granted because uh, with the lockdown, the heightened restrictions, the concept of space has become uh, treasured, um, relooked in a different perspective because uh, we are all stuck at home. Some homes may be more crowded than normal. So we appreciate the concept of space. And then when we go out during circuit breaker and the lockdown in the streets, the streets are empty, there's so much space with no people there. So I think the concepts of time, space, and you know, we are already in this pandemic for more than coming to two years. The elasticity of the concept has, has, has been there, it's fluid, it's ever, ever changing. And um, I think uh, this, this exhibition is therefore very apt how we want to negotiate these concepts of time and space. So maybe I will go around and, and ask some of the artists, um, yes, to, to give us some of their responses. Maybe you, they can share with us how and what they inspired them to come out with these works in, in, the, in the first place. Uh, for, for me to start, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to see all the photographs uh, taken by by um, Edmund because um, I wish I had because I grew up in Pongo in, a, in an old Pongo farm where my grandfather grew pigs and all that I also had my maternal grandparents in Outram living in Outram but the, the, what we see now is a piece of barren land they, they, they demolished the buildings in Outram uh, you know where the Chakwitya was and, and, and the, the plot of land has been sitting there vacant for years and I'm thinking to myself, why do you demolish and you know, evict my grandmother from her home and leave the plot of land empty for decades? So I, I really uh, am very happy to see the black and white photographs and so maybe Edmund can, can share with us a little bit about how he goes about you know, deciding what he thinks is, is worth documenting. Okay. Um, I mean, I grew up in Topayo, so um, 
I think a lot of people criticize uh, HDB estates as being very, very mundane, it's very ordinary, it's a cookie cutter, it's just slab blocks. But um, although being an architect myself, we always feel that uh, we tend to be a bit more biased, you know. We always feel that a good architecture will actually create good livelihoods, good neighbourhoods, but no matter how mundane the environment is, I feel, actually at the end of the day, it's the, it's the humanity that's in the neighbourhoods that actually brings out the, the character and uh, it imbues the neighbourhood with life. You can have a master architect design an award-winning building, but I think if you do not have people who feel an attachment to the place, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's only half as good, right? So, and um, when we were in school, I think uh, there's this book that we are all made to, to, to read. Uh, that book is called uh, A Pattern Language by an author called Christopher Alexander. And it doesn't talk about the buildings. It talks about the spaces between the buildings, right? <clears throat> How certain buildings form uh, dense fabric and how some buildings form different kind of uh, uh, spatial uh, experience, right? And I think uh, growing up in a HTV estate for 30 over years, I, I think uh, it's just, I, I, I just feel drawn to take the photos. I mean, the photos do not have a, any uh, particular agenda to it. Huh? I mean, I'm just taking it because I'm just drawn to it because I, I, can, I can see life in it. I can see humanity in it. I can see perseverance in it. People really trying to make a living despite difficult circumstances. And um, it's a matter of composition. It's a matter of lighting. And not because I want to convey some kind of agenda, you know. So I think what I just hope to achieve la, through my photographs is maybe just to um, you know, give all these ordinary things a bit more attention, a bit more scrutiny, a bit more uh, dignity, you know, um, because actually these are the things that are often overlooked, and, but I think they are, they are beautiful, you know. So um, this is just my, my, uh, my uh, motivation uh, for taking the photographs. So I, I just hope you enjoyed it, you know, and when Jeff approached me to, to uh, it all started because I gave him a photograph of one of the one I took at the mosque. And then <laughs> during Hari Raya, so I printed one for my Muslim friend here and another one. And then he asked me, he said, oh, do you have other photographs? And then when he saw the others, he said, okay, we put this together. And I thought as three friends, you know, we just put something together. I thought it's, it's quite uh, meaningful. Lah. So how, that's how this exhibition came about. You know, so um, yeah, that's I think what I want to say. Yeah, yeah I think uh, as I was sharing with uh, some of the guests just now that I think the organic evolutionary process of how things come together is, is very intriguing. Uh, just like how the three of them have come together with different uh, skill sets and different um, domain expertise to come and put together an exhibition like that. I think it's very heartening, just like how in a book that, uh, you know, Mass designs and I edit and someone else writes and researches, it all comes beautifully together. So maybe before, uh, without much further ado, I will also just ask Jeffrey. Uh, I've always been amazed by, by Jeffrey's uh, brush strokes. Yeah, he's the building whisperer. I wonder what, what he hears from the buildings. But, you know, I find it uh, quite impossible to replicate his brush stroke. You look at the painting, you know it's Jeffrey Wan Lee's. So maybe you, you, you can share with us a little bit about, um, I mean, the recent series that's being exhibited here are all the national icons of the National Theatre and all that. So what, 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 what are some of the emotions that go through you? Because I can imagine, uh, you know, going, I always see you bending over this big canvas and doing the brush strokes. So, you know, without seeing the final output, you don't know what he's drawing, but in his mind, you know, he has this imagery and he has these messages that's being whispered to him by the building. So maybe you could uh, enlighten us a little bit about your artistic, what's, what's going on in that mind? What messages are you hearing from the building and that can 
perform such beautiful artworks, you know? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, hello all. Uh, thank you, Xiao Sir. Uh, you, you know, the, a building is like, a building is like a human form, isn't it? Technically, yeah, yeah, it's like human form. He has, he has a facade, windows, this strength, structure, and all that. It's just like a human being with a face, a head, hands, and all that. It, it, it's not uh, spiritual, but I, I felt that a, a building form, when it has its occupants, it forms a kind of a life. You know? It's a kind of a life. I would go to spiritual content and all that, but as it's a result of that, it, it, forms like, I won't say a living thing, but it's an environment where uh, there are, I won't say souls, but th there's a certain kind of mechanism that I very difficult for me to explain, you see. When a building is left empty, it's left soulless. But a building that is occupied, it, has, it becomes alive. Uh, sometimes, uh, why... Uh, why I was called a building whisperer also was not conned by me, but by my friend. Uh, sometimes when I engage into an artwork, I kind of dwell into the, the particular environment of sin, and I kind of transport myself there and having a conversation with what I do, you see. Yeah. So uh, it, it's like talking to a friend, you know, in, in that sense. I think. Mean, Sometimes when I do my work and I will be conversing and talking to the National Library and this and that, and Mars will be asking me, hey, who are you talking to? I said, no, no, I'm just, I'm just embarking on this process to get, to, get to, to meet a friend, have a conversation with a friend. Yeah. So uh, why I choose these three buildings? Uh, I was born in the 60s, the Beatles era. Uh, just before National Day, you know? A day before National Day, a year before National Day. So, this National Icons is already a, being a part of my life. It is actually a part of my life. I, I grew up with these three icons, practically grew up with them. Uh, education, the library, where else to go, the library. We don't pot at Starbucks or Coffee Bean at that time. Library was a place. Uh, education, the books. Culture, arts, uh, music, the National Theatre. That was a period, right? It was the place where uh, not only the arts congregate, but it's a, like a community space and it is where all genres of, of, uh, what do you call it, of, of, of music and dance were performed there. Yeah, sports, the national theater, the national stadium. Yeah, it is a magnificent building. At a point of time, the the environment the, is uh, it's different from today's uh, sports hub. It's once you get inside the building, is you know it's can, can you imagine during those days of the era? Uh, Football. Just just mention football. They they say national stadium, and national day parades were there. So uh, I played in national theatre. I was inside. I was inside. I played. I played the clarinet there. Played solo for indoor band competition. I felt the space at that point of time. Uh, it is it is the pace for us together, and I felt the presence of the uh, the cultures different cultures different music genres and everything there the national stadium can you imagine thousands at the throng queuing up for tickets and all that you know the lights the spectacle and 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 young people selling kuei kuei tea and all that you know the 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 environment is different, it's, 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 it's different from today. The National Library, it used to take bus number 13, you know, number 13 that goes Orchard Road, pass by there. Sometimes I take 51 from Yunos. Every time when we have kind of uh, a place to meet and it will be the library. And sometimes when you go up the steps of the library with the significant bricks and all that, you know, it's, 
is a place to meet the canteen uh, ice kacang, right? Again, ice kacang is your favorite, yeah. So these three iconic buildings are part of the period of nation building, one, and it also part of the life experiences that I went through eh, of almost half of my life, yeah. And these are some of the shared memories that I have with people, you see. So I'm, I'm into heritage and culture and all that. Some people say, hey, why you paint all these buildings? You know, I said, why can't I paint all these buildings? These are all my memories. It's all timeless to me. I'm giving them a, a place, right? They're all gone, but I'm giving them a place and happy to have it shared with other people. And uh, sometimes, I, people say, why the nostalgia? Actually, it's not nostalgia. If you look back, it's happiness, is it? I'm, I'm drawing happiness from doing these buildings. And it is also quite important during this pandemic time, is it? Yeah. Though they are gone. Yeah, they are gone. They, are, they live in our books. She can wrote a book also, a memories book. Yeah. But these three buildings are iconic to a lot of yeah, that, that's the book by Chicken. You want the best book, right? Yeah. I the last book. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So they are significant to Singapore. They are significant to, to me, significant to a lot of people from my generation. And it's something that uh, I would like to convey the message, you know, of awareness, uh, history awareness and things that we went through. Our history is short-lived in a way because a lot of nice old buildings are just being just gone due to yeah ever-changing uh, what do you call it expansion and you know yeah and all that. So I I hope you oh yeah and by the way I don't use a brush. So I use I, I paint from the bottle and yes it's quite backbreaking sometimes because I paint on the floor it has to be flat and I I let the liquid flow by itself, getting a kind of a natural flow and I like the material speaks by itself in, in a sense, yeah, yeah. So, yes, thank you, Xiao Sir. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I dare not disturb you when he's <laughs> bent over the canvas. I just leave him and his canvas to, yeah. you know, have the, their own internal conversation. So it's quite cute, he mentioned ice kacang and then Chikien lit up, his face lit up because, you know, he, he liked ice kacang, right? He's, Profile photo got ice kacang eating. Anyway, yeah, so, so thank you, Jeffrey, for, for sharing. So when I took a quick look at the exhibition just now, I was quite struck by um, how different, you know, the, the old black and white photos and, and Hong Kit's uh, futuristic uh, depictions of, of what, you know. And, and what struck me was that actually um, it may seem futuristic to, to us to, at present, these things may feel futuristic. But if you think about it, two years ago, pre-pandemic, we also never thought that um, the airport could be parked. So many scoot planes all, all at once, right? So it is something that we never imagined could happen. Uh, planes being, uh, you know, grounded, airports empty, streets empty, expressways empty, skies are bluer, less pollution. So this thing about uh, futuristic actually is relative, right? So then we play back decades ago, what is retro now to us is actually present in the past, right? So in the 60s, all the fashion, all the stuff, we think now, because we are in the future, we think those as retro. And now when we look at so-called futuristic works, Perhaps it is not really futuristic because who could have imagined what we are seeing today in the pandemic? Many things were reimagined, workplaces, um, the structures of society and the routines, you know, work from home and all that. So I'm quite uh, curious to find out from Hong Kit when he does this, is he really looking at it as a futuristic point of view or short of having a crystal ball kind of thing? But is he trying to... Um, interpret the different functions and utility uh, of society, be it the home, the workplace, or the commune, or open spaces like this, 
Uh, yeah, could you maybe share with us a little bit about what is your thought process? Is it really futuristic? P perhaps our younger generation, when they look at it, it's like, no, it is not. It is very much in the present. Thank you, Stelzer. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Honkit here. I have to let you in in a secret, but you cannot, you know, uh, tell everybody, okay? I'm actually a time traveller from, uh, <laughs> from 2080, so I, yeah, yeah. So, did that answer your question, Selzer? <laughs> so, uh, well, I, I get to do the fun part. I was telling these guys, right? One get to do in sepia, one to do in black and white. So I, I had colors to play with, you see? So I'm, I'm looking at uh, the future. I'm playing with colors. And I'm doing things uh, slightly different from Jeff. Jeff uses a brush, but I use uh, my computer skills to actually build models. So all these paintings actually existed as a, as, a, as a model on a computer. Then I digitally paint it. So it's, um, it's a new way of, a, it's a unique way of doing things, but I'm not saying it's the, it's the only way, but it's just an alternative way of doing things, yeah? So yes, um, my, my take is on the future, on time and space. So when I look in the future, I, I want to bring myself 50, 60 years from now. So my, my interest lies in like, being an architect, right? Uh, on social housing, on um, climate change, and of course our transport, uh, and of course our beloved country, Singapore. What happens in 50 years, 60 years? What happens when there's climate change, when there's water rising? What happens? So my, some might take the dystopian look at it, you know, say, oh, it's doom and gloom. Or we might take a step back, why don't look at it differently? It need not be utopian. It could be a, simply a way of how Singapore might uh, survive and thrive in, you know, in, in, uh, in a climate that has changed. And of course, then I look at um, things like my conversation with my painting started with looking at things that are nature because um, you know, nature always prevails. And looking at nature and how does it affect our built environment? So, and uh, I want to approach my paintings in a tongue-in-cheek manner because I like to bring humour to my paintings, right? So, if I, I did the first piece, which is HDB, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a take on HDB. And us being Singaporeans are always like busy as bees buzzing around, you know, all day long. So, the concept of HDBs was, to me, was quite apt. And in terms like, and everybody in, in Singapore is like, when they grow up as a family, right, and then they grow bigger, they tend to move house. And when they move house, they pack their little bags and they'll have call a, a guy to come and a van to come and, you know, transport their, their stuff to another place. So maybe 50, 60 years down, you can actually call a drone, you know, a drone B will come on, come to your apartment, pluck out your whole apartment, and just transport your whole apartment, lock, stock and barrel to another place. So. The whole idea is starting conversations. It may not be true in, in 60 or 70 years' time, but it's something that could be a possibility and could be something that, what if, right? So the second painting I did was actually on a tribute to National Day. So as a tribute to National Day, what happens to climate change? And the tongue-in-cheek is that it's a former Marina Bay, right? So what happens then, right? So, but the whole thing is that it's not a picture of gloom, it's a picture of, uh, of how Singapore will thrive in, in years to come, where we become nomadic, where we become, actual fact, a really an island state that, you know, traveling around the world. We become world citizens, right? And we'll spend time, maybe, uh, you know, uh, so one of these stars could be Ang Mo Kyu, another one could be Bishan. So, it's a new take on how uh, the island state will become. Singapore might become island states, become an island state, instead of just one, right? So, uh, that's my take on other stuff as well, on transport, on, you know, on uh, the daffodil as a, as, as, a, as a cloud port instead of an airport. So in the future, because of land is scarce, right, we might not be, we might not have an airport, like, I'm looking at T5, because T5, uh, as you all know, was won recently, but it's put on hold, it was supposed to receive close to 70 to 80 million passengers a year when it is built. So just imagine that. So, but, but now during, I mean, and the current condition doesn't even allow you to bring in like, maybe that day was only less than 500 passengers coming into Singapore. 
So conversations like this, like, like, like what Celso said, we could not have imagined of this situation happening two years ago, right? So, but things change. So my conversation with my paintings and the future is that, what if, you know, and the conversation starts from there. And uh, my, my, my uh, hope is for the audience to actually look at the paintings and see that, you know, ah, oh, this could happen. I didn't think of it that way, you know, it could possibly be there or not. So it starts you thinking, it starts you questioning maybe. And then that will be my true purpose and my aim for my audience, yeah, and for those who enjoy my paintings. Yeah. Thank you, Selsa. Yeah, so now we've heard from the artists, maybe we'll hear some perspectives from our panelists. So Dr. Chiki, you want to share with us I actually brought this book. Uh, I, 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 didn't, I bought this, I must clarify, uh, before I, I knew, before I knew Shikin, uh, I was more struck by the, the play of the word building memories and I flipped through the book at the, I think it was the Singapore Writers Festival. Uh, they had the last copy there. It wasn't cheap but I bought it anyway because I am a lover of books. I love it. I flipped through it and there were all these very quaint uh, art craft elements inside. And I thought, oh my, it's such a lovely book and all the national icons. And I think uh, I'm, I'm also a, a volunteer with the Singapore Memory Project. So I can totally identify with the need to document memories. So maybe I can ask you, uh, first of all, what is your response to some of these works? And this thing about uh, painting happiness is not about nostalgia. You know, people say nostalgia is overrated and how important it is to hold on to these um, memories. Uh, like, you know, Jeffrey paints all the national icons. You also have them depicted in your beautiful book of the year. So maybe you want to share with us a little bit. Is it a little bit... Uh, is it about a personal journey because your memory of a place is different from his memory of a place, is different from her memory of a place, but yet, collectively as a nation, as a society, we have a collective memory or experience of a place. Uh, be it, maybe it's a little bit different in different era. So what, what's your take on that? Uh, thank you, Sir. Hi, uh, <coughs> Chicken here. Um, I, think, I think it's... Uh, my, my, my first and primary role uh, that I have to declare is that I'm uh, very close friends with all, all three uh, artists uh, because uh, we have been uh, there time traveling and uh, sweating you know, in the studios uh, together in the, in the same building uh, for many years. So my, my first loyalty is as a friend to, to all, all three who, who I know very well. Uh, and I think the the reason I became uh, sort of tried to work on architectural history is also through a similar similar kind of uh, context and backgrounds uh, of all, 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 all the three artists. You know. uh, as an architect, you have to sort of imagine the future, time traveling, uh, and then as a, as a historian, you know, we try to sort of look at the context and 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 the very particular context of the. Uh, of, of the 1960s, which we are all sort of uh, uh, part of. So, so there's, there's, uh, there's definitely a lot of connections to uh, all of the artworks. And, um, and, and of course, as a, uh, from, from, from my head as an architecture historian, of course, this, this is an ideal situation where you can use different media to look at the, look at the different periods. Uh, and uh, the, value of the, the value of all three uh, uh, are important to me because, firstly, you know, um, the photographs, the photographs really have helped us to uh, contextualize the place and, and also capture certain things that we don't know about. Uh, and even personally, you know, sometimes I would go around uh, photographing like uh, Edmund, and sometimes you would capture things that much later you you only uh, find it useful. So, for example. Uh, I took a photograph of a shop house at the uh, Buntat Street, and many many years later, when I'm trying to write about hawkers, then I noticed there's a actually a no hawking sign on the shop house that I've taken, like you know, uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and then of course this uh, very important period of uh, nation building, and the reason why we sort of uh, chose 
uh, these four buildings in the book. Uh, the one that uh, Jeffrey has yet to paint is the <laughs> conference, conference hall. Um, because maybe it's still around, but it's also not, uh, it's also not the original. I mean, it's been renovated and you know, uh, changed. So, so this, all, all of these uh, buildings actually mean a lot to all of us. And in trying to write the book, we felt that you know, it shouldn't be just a very cut and dry uh, way to, to express the history. Yes, the, the histories are there, but we wanted to talk about uh, memories as, as collective, as you, as, you, as you mentioned. And that, that doesn't just come from the perspective of whoever writes the history or whoever tries to write the history. Thus, it has to be a contribution by uh, different voices. So, so you can see that we've tried to uh, present you know, certain kinds of certain memories, like uh, the first local librarian, Hedwig Anwar, for the National Library. We have uh, Malik Awak, uh, who interestingly was selling the kue, kue you know, and the uh, you know the the kacang pute and all that. So he was actually selling, you know, uh, at the at the stadium. He saw Dola Kasim was mesmerized, and then he became uh, a, a footballer himself. So, so these and and also we had uh, our poet uh, Wei Kim Cheng, uh, who was very much inspired by his time, you know, in the library. So how how do we bring some of these memories together uh, alongside with uh, some of the interviews that we did? Right? So. Uh, Alfred, Mr. Alfred Wong is still around. And of course, the architect for um, the National Stadium, Mr. Tan Chu Guan, his, his name is never cited because you know, it, it isn't him that signed the drawings, but he was the one, you know, and hopefully we give voice to, to, to more of the people. And then finally, of course, you know, uh, with uh, Hong Kit, that uh, we've, we've also sort of uh, thought through, you know, uh, enjoyed reading his comics and you know, we also sort of, uh, try to sort of imagine right, as architects we have to sort of visualize what the future is. So this, these, this exhibition is uh, actually very meaningful to me but, uh, but, but in particular um, as my primary role of uh, a friend to all, of, all, all three artists here. Yeah. As we all are. So uh, I'm also here because of my loyalty to them <laughs> as friends. <laughs> anyway, over to you Prof. What, what are some of the very um, moving responses that you see when you come to the, an, an exhibition like that that has a different um, you know, domain kind of juxtaposed against each other, uh, yet there is a common thread that's, that's uh, running through these exhibitions uh, from the past to the present to the future and how uh, as an individual, as a society, our identity or our personality of it changes over time. Sure. Prof. Thank you. Um, I, first of all, uh, it's so nice, so precious in the midst of a pandemic. Once again for Jeff and Bas and Maya to bring us together in person. You know, uh, this is uh, more than just a way of coping with a very unprecedented planetary crisis. And, and, and the art that we see around us is in some ways not just a kind of resistance, but, but really a, a, a creative response. Uh, not just to the pandemic, because the way that Singapore has developed uh, raises many, many issues uh, in relation to history, memory, and heritage. So I'd just like to quickly uh, step, take a few steps back, but may I first uh, note the, the timing of this discussion coming uh, right after the announcement of Hidayah's prize, <laughs> right? And somehow there is a great affinity between this book, which everybody must buy, and, and the exhibition, and, and this is not accidental because uh, we have a few laborers of love behind uh, this and they are connected with Maya and, and so on. But it's, you know, uh, when newspapers make reports of, of prizes and so on, I, I thought this report in the Straits Times did go 
more deeply than a lot of reports, you know. Uh, so, for example, the, just the opening lines when, when Hidayah, uh, when her home that which she lived in for almost 30 years, this is the opening uh, line, was acquired by the state in 1999, she felt as if a piece of herself had been taken away and turned to writing to process her emotions. Uh, just, if you indulge me, I'll just read a little more. Uh, when it happened, I just felt a piece of me was taken away and I just felt very lost. I, that got me thinking, I need to find myself, so I decided to write the memories. So, turning to the three artists here, who happen to be also architects, there's something is happening. This is, you know, uh, it's interesting, Jeffrey said that uh, it's not nostalgia, it's some kind of happiness that he's trying to engage with. So, uh, and then of course, uh, 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 Edmund, you were talking about growing up in Topayo, and uh, Honkert is of course imagining the future using the most advanced kind of technology that we have. So, the, 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 the techniques and the materials uh, somehow go together with this kind of imagination. Ink is fluid, black and white freezes the moment in, in many shades of, of grey, and of course the kind of burst of colours that you see in Hong Kit's work really takes you out of, jolts you out of the present. Eh? So I'd just like to go back to say that it's interesting to me that the exhibition is simply entitled Time and Space. Because time, we think about the arrow of time. You know, the arrow of time is such that it's irreversible. And in the case of Singapore, it's even more irreversible. Because before you know it, the building that you, you live in when as a child, not only that building is gone, the entire neighbourhood is gone. <laughs> it's a very radical kind of uh, modernity that, that we are experiencing in, in, in Singapore. And uh, so time, the arrow of time, the irreversibility of, of, of history uh, in such a radical manner. And, and in Singapore, the whole question of space, space we know can be very boundless. But in Singapore, space is translated into other words like territory. I mean, being a small island state, very conscious about its relations with the rest of the region and the world. But when we say space in Singapore, a dominant word that we use is property. Right? So property, territory, this relates to the political economy of space, the question of ownership and control of spaces, which, which again raises questions about uh, why and how spaces can disappear, and along with them, what does that do for what does that do, not just for human beings, but to human beings? So I, I think there's a lot going on here in this exhibition. And as I said, the timing of these questions, uh, which are quite uh, recurring in, in, in Singapore. I can't resist a, a, a certain uh, uh, humorous line here. Uh, Hidayat spoke about feeling very lost. Eh? And you spoke about dealing with nostalgia and looking for that kind of happiness. You know the word nostalgia, when you spell it out and you play this word game, you, 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 you switch the words, the letters around, nostalgia can be read as loss again. <laughs> yeah. And in Singapore, we are constantly lost again. Right? And in some ways, uh, I don't see these works as being, you know, anything like political resistance. In some ways, they are even more profound, deeper than political resistance. It, because it's a kind of existential search for meaning uh, under circumstances in which you don't only feel lost, sometimes you even feel quite hopeless. So when, uh, when, uh, when Edmund talks about dignity, when Jeffrey talks about happiness, when Honkit talks about humour, these are ways in which 
we are not just coping. We are actually actively responding and imagining and reimagining. So, Hong Kid, you talk about thinking and questioning and so on. Really, it's a process that we must have and we must have more and we must go more deeply in a place like Singapore, which, in which if you don't hold things in memory, they are irreversibly lost, especially in the Republic of Collective Amnesia. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Yeah, it, it, it is quite um, amazing that you, you see nostalgia with Lost again. Um, yeah, but I think in Singapore, um, I was reading this uh, book and it kind of uh, introduced uh, two concepts where in Singapore, I mean, even for like land use, right? We, we tend to categorize things, land zones. Uh, this zone is for, you know, commercial buildings or residential zoning, planning. But perhaps our government looks too much into categorization uh, or maximizing land use. So we don't want to waste our precious real estate land. So we want to zone everything nicely. We want to optimize and maximize the utility that we can squeeze out of that plot of land. But perhaps as, uh, you know, archi uh, historians and all that, we, we want to look at it as a connection rather than category. So we may categorize a lot of things into um, you know, land zones, planning kind of thing and what kind of uh, this, this area is zoned for this use but we often neglect our connection so you can tear down this building, change the land use zone it, something else but in there lies the loss again of the connection that the citizens of a country have to a, to a place so um, Mr. Teo, you have written widely about all these arts and um, you're a veteran in this industry. You've seen so many uh, of uh, famous artists' artworks. It, 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 how do you make sense of this um, two polarizing, you know, categorization and connection? Because if we try to categorize whether it's art, buildings or anything, we lose the emotive side of the connection. And I think this is a problem with our our state we we like to categorize we are very you know uh pro, we process it that that way that with economical benefits uh gain and loss kind of thing but we often neglect the emotive connections to places to the space um, because we view space as a real estate but space is not a real estate you 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 can leave a piece of land Empty, but it is not wasted. Yeah, maybe yeah, we can okay. hear your views on, on this. Thank you, Siap Sir. Yeah, um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Maya Gallery for putting together this exhibition, which I find uh, quite exceptional. Uh, in my experience, uh, you know, looking at exhibitions, particularly exhibitions at galleries, commercial galleries, galleries that exhibit to sell, you know. Um, very few of them actually put too much thought into how to group the works together in terms of cu curatorial approach. Uh, in this one, I must compliment Maya Gallery for actually, you know, organizing this with a theme like that, time and space, you know, with the with the with architecture running as a as a thread running through it, um, which is very rare. I, I must say this uh, to me sets an example for ex for galleries to actually do exhibitions. Yeah, and Xiaoxi, um, uh, you're right. You know, I like the word you the way you describe this being uh, organic. Yeah, <laughs> I mean. Uh, a few weeks ago, we, I mean, the, 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 the fact that we are here uh, participating in this is somehow quite organic too. Uh, you know, being organic, I think it, it probably means that we don't have to over plan, you know. 
we have to force things and so on. Um, we we spent uh, an afternoon uh, enjoy, enjoying talking to the artists who were, who were here uh, at the exhibition, and we had really a very interesting conversation talking about the artworks, talking about the uh, the ideas behind all these works and so on. Yeah, we kind of went to quite a lot of, uh, <laughs> of the analysis uh, of the various works and so on. And I actually enjoyed talking uh, particularly with uh, Edmund about photography, about all these uh, photography, photographs of uh, buildings and so on. I myself also uh, am into photography. I recommended a few uh, photographers, uh, you know, old veteran uh, Singapore pioneer photographers to Edmund. Um, a, a lot of, a lot of scene or landscape we take, you know, in photographs, the, the human, the humanistic or the human activity is very important. I recently uh, put together a, a series of photographs called laundry. You know, laundry is a human activity. Uh, when you have pictures of uh, buildings, scenery, and, and so on, the laundry stands out as a very strong symbol of human activity. This, um, I thought about this, and uh, you know, it, it, the inspiration came from Wu Guanzhong. Wu Guanzhong, as a painter, during the time uh, when political uh, political conditions did not allow artists to paint human figures realistically. They needed, you know, the, 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 the government, <laughs> the CCP actually uh, dictated that uh, artists should paint hu human beings, you know, or, or should highlight the virtues of workers. Yeah the proletariat. So Wu Guanzhong, as, a, as an artist during that time, he was a painter of human figures, you know. He couldn't do, you know, in his scenery, landscape, and a lot of paintings, he couldn't do human figures. Instead, he, he painted laundry to suggest this human activity, human habitation, and so on and so forth. So I, yeah, I, I, quite, uh, I was quite taken by some of these photographs which, which uh, suggest, you know, I mean, with the buildings, you need uh, some suggestions of human activity and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, then we talked about this futuristic, <laughs> immediately, you know, we thought of science fiction, <laughs> yeah, in Hong Kid's work. And, uh, and that particular painting, you know, and you look again, ah, you know, it suggested to us this, uh, the, the state, state crest, right? Yeah, with the five stars and the crest, at the crescent moon. So, uh, well, we went on quite a bit. And uh, then with uh, Jeffrey, I've been following Jeffrey's work for quite a while, <laughs> I must say, <laughs> yeah, for quite a while. I think I followed you from, yeah, from various <laughs> venues, from various <laughs> venues, <laughs> yeah, from uh, North Bridge Road, Road <laughs> Paya Lebar, uh, Changi, and all, 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 all the way through, uh, very closely, actually. Uh, and today you were telling us that uh, you did not use a brush. Then it struck me, because I often wondered how very lack of gestural, uh, what you call traces that you know some of your strokes. You know, you usually with ink you you find brush strokes, but yours there is no brush stroke, right? You, you just strip, yeah. That, that suggests to me uh, that the way you just created your lines by dripping, 
by you know letting the 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 dye flow naturally yeah it's a uh, uh, somehow it it's very rhythmic even yeah and uh, and because you say ink i tend to because i look i deal with a lot of ink work so i tend to associate your painting with chinese ink work yeah yet i can see that it's well i can see the parallel I cannot, I cannot connect because there's no gestural kind of traces. Yeah. So, uh, yet one can actually sense uh, this, this, this rhythmic. You know, the the lines in Chinese uh, painting and Chinese calligraphy tends to have this rhythm. You know, yet. Somehow I can see that rhythm in the in the lines that you created. I find that very interesting. Yeah, it may it may not be so much uh, uh, your experience with Chinese art. It may have to do with your music. Yeah, I so. yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I, I find that very interesting. Yeah, so yeah, I think the way we are here participating, Cameron and I are participating, somehow it's quite organic, quite natural, some, you know, because after having this conversation on parting, uh, Ma said, would you like to come and, uh, you know, join us? <laughs> we, we agreed readily and so on. So here we are. So I'm very glad uh, to be able to spend the time, wonderful afternoon here, talking about this exhibition. Jeffrey, you want to respond to that? Uh, the dripping? Uh, the rhythm and the flow? Uh, I, I guess there were some comments that I received. Some, uh, some comments where there were a bit of musicality in my work. Uh, some look at it and say it's a, it's a composition, it's like an arrangement of music. Some depict that and some say that it's bouncing lines and it's like a rhythmic form. Rhythmic. Yeah, rhythmic form. So coincidentally, I, I mean, I'm also into music. I, I love music. I, I, I wanted to be a musician, but it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, that's another story. So, yeah, so, yeah, I, when I was in, yeah, when I was playing in National Theatre, I was 15, 16. I, at that time, I was already writing music. I was helping my dad. My dad was a composer. Yeah, doing arrangements and all that for his, uh, some of his TV shows and all that. Yeah. So, and I, w I still played music. A bit struggling now because lack of practice. The last music uh, gig was uh, 2018. I think Chicken uh, uh, Prof also came down to take a look. He was in, uh, what do you call it, uh, for my dad's uh, music and all that. So, yeah, I, I do feel a. Yeah, it, it's that the it's very unintentional when I hold the bottle and I let the liquid flow. It's as if that the the blood is like it's like a connection to the liquid on my li my body to the thing. I didn't intend it to be thick or thin, but I let the rhythmic reaction in the body flow. Is it? I mean, that's how that's how it is. But uh, like Afandi, uh -huh. yeah, the Indonesian uh, artist, yeah. uh, oh, yes, Afandi. instead of uh, using the brush, yeah, he, used from he the, squeezed, squeezed the, from the you know, yes, directly. Yeah. Yes, directly. So creating yeah. the impasto yeah. you know, yeah. on his painting, yeah. which is very effective. <laughs> Maybe I got influenced a bit by that also. Uh, Ka Aziza said that my work reminds her of Afandi. I say Afandi is a different leg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning. Yeah, I think this, uh, this idea of flow and rhythm, it, it's very apt uh, because, I mean, you can imagine, right, like uh, a, a water system, like if you, if you dam the stream or you dam the river, you, when you disrupt the flow of the water flow, you create other problems that were not intended. So with the recent Bukit Timah flooding, you know, uh, it's because we disrupt the flow somewhere in the system uh, due to construction, demolition and all that And then you upset the rhythm of things So, you know, it's, it's also the same like in a conversation If you interrupt someone, you, you disrupt his flow of thought So I think in the 
this creative space, it is very apt to talk about rhythm, be it musical rhythm, artistic rhythm, inspirational flow of, of things. So, um, you know, it's, it's, and then the organic part, um, it, sometimes it's as organic as I, I think I was telling someone, uh, and all my projects are very organic, almost as organic as uh, my kitchen scrap composting, you know, it's, it's very organic because I don't plan for it, whatever scraps come into the kitchen, I cut it up, I put it in the thing and then it turns into this kind of golden, uh, black gold they call it, right? So you don't plan for it, just like you don't plan your, where you're going to drip, there's no recipe. You know, your dripping is almost like when you cook all the oil will splatter onto the side and then from the side you kind of know how, how, um, how big the fire was or how much oil you've used. There's no recipe involved and you cook with uh, aga-aga kind of thing, you know? So yeah, maybe at this juncture it is, it is uh, suitable to open up to any questions or thoughts or comments that the audience may have after listening to our six esteemed speakers? Actually, I'd like to add something. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to add something to what Chi Ken and uh, Prof Kwok uh, said la, sure. earlier. I'm actually a Boy Kim Cheng's uh, classmate in secondary school. And uh, even back then, I think in sec secondary one or two, I mean, while the kids, are, some of our classmates are playing soccer or doing what the boys do, you know, we engage in conversations about uh, Singapore losing heritage. And even back then, I don't think I have that kind of uh, uh, emotions that Kim Cheng had. La. I think being a poet, he's really, he's very emotional, you know. And I never thought that one day we will lose, Singapore will lose this son. You know, he became so disillusioned that he left Singapore and migrated to Australia. And he wrote poems that became required text for tertiary students taking poetry and creative writing. So, you know, in some ways, it, I want to react also to Prof Kwok's uh, men use of two adjectives, you know. One is irreversible, the other one is radical. Because sometimes on hindsight, when I think about the photographs I take, and then I was talking to Jeff, you know, Lee Kuan Yew likes to say Singapore became from third world to first world in one generation. I mean, if I might rephrase that, we are all born in about six, I'm 65, 64, I think, yeah, 68. If I may rephrase that, actually Singapore became third world to first world in our generation. Mm -hmm. So we saw it with our own eyes, actually how Singapore changed. And to put it simply, I was born in 65, that's when Singapore is founded. I'm 56 years old and so is Singapore, 56 years old. But you just compare Singapore to a country with 5,000 years of history like China and Japan. I'm just, sometimes I just think, is it because we have such a short history, that's why we just say, ah, nama la tira apa la, just demolish. <laughs> we don't really care. We don't really, we don't really cherish it because we don't have a very long uh, history, you know. So we don't, we just feel that, you know, we, are, we, we need to modernize, we need to, it becomes a very radical uh, uh, approach. And that is precisely how Kim Cheng write. If you look at the poem, The Planners, it actually talks about how heavy-handed the urban planning authority is, you know? How they decide to demolish, they just demolish. <laughs> because they don't think twice, because we have a very short history. We don't really find that it's so precious to really go and uh, preserve it. But the problem is, as architects, we are constantly asked this question by all the veterans of architecture like Keng Soon, William Lim, you know, we are confronted with this thing about finding a Singapore identity. But the problem is if you keep on de de demolishing heritage, how the hell are we going to find identity, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, and it doesn't just happen in architecture. A few months ago, you, we, we, we read about some fashion design, uh, fashion school, they graduated and then in the live section, they published you know, publish uh, their, the students' work. 
And again, they talk about Singapore identity, but sometimes I'm just thinking, do we need that baggage? Because we are only 56 years old to start with, you know. We don't have this historical baggage to start with in the first place, you know. So sometimes it's, a, it's quite a dilemma, I feel, you know. For me, sometimes, do I really need to do architecture with a Singapore identity, you know? Or should I just discard all this and just start on a fresh slate, lah? you know? So this is something I find it's, a, it's something, I, I don't want to call myself an artist, lah, because it's just a way of conveying, uh, like, like Prof. Kok say, lah, it's just a way of conveying our, our response to, to what is happening. You know, but we don't want to be uh, uh, disheartened or depressed about it. Lah. You know, we responded it to it in, different, in our own different ways. Lah. But I think it's, uh, it's something that we need to, Singapore as a nation needs to think about. Lah. Because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something that, you know, we, we, we tend, if we do not think about it, it's going to be more and more irreversible. <laughs> You know, yeah. more and more neighborhoods are going to be, you know, going to be, uh, you know, just discarded. Uh. Yeah. Any comments from the floor? Yes, please, Chicken. Yeah, I think um, Heng started uh, by quoting uh, about Idaya's nostalgia. You can, you can probably imagine that I, I couldn't be an architecture historian. You know? There was so much anger and angst that clouded out any way of any way of even trying to you know rationally try to convey what uh, what I want to say right to in in, in writing uh, some of the things that I wrote about you know there was one stage where I, I couldn't I couldn't deal with you know the you know this this feeling at all right that uh, you want to write about something but it's you know it's fast disappearing and then now you have the, now I, I see it as a, you know, a, a, a kind of, I, I wouldn't call it responsibility, but you know, if I want to write, and as everybody has been discussing, we, we, we see it, uh, we see it being constructed, we see it being torn down, and you know, that's, that's uh, something that's very difficult for me, right? like uh, National Theatre and you know, all this. I think, I think there's a lot of that uh, that is uh, inevitable. I think Ken Woon and myself, we were at the discussion for the National Library, right? the, 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 the conversion and all that. So, that, so we've, we've seen that process, but, but I think um, after I was able to calm down and to try to put on my head again as, a, as someone write, trying to write about all of these uh, place history or architectural history, um, then we, you, you also see certain kinds of uh, continuities as well. You know? So if we, if we look deep enough and we kind of understand the areas enough, we can perhaps also see some of the continuities. So say, for example, we, we talked about uh, National Library you know, and, and the canteen. The, the canteen was uh, St. Andrew's School's canteen. Right? It, was, it was a canteen for a reason. And a lot of you don't no notice it, but you know the, the coconut trees that were planted in front of the, I mean, they were, they were, they were there in front of, of the National Library. They were, they were there when they had uh, St. Andrew's School. So there, was some, there are some things that are sort of a continuity, and, and uh, Edwin talked about Topayo. And Topayo is also a very, um, very specific uh, housing estate as well. Now we just say HDBs as if to cover the entire scope, you know, from the front. And, and, and in the process, we also don't think about the, the, the work of uh, Singapore Improvement Trust, SIT. And Topayo was already planned, right? in, but not in the same way as we see it today. Uh, and so that there are some continuities. So, so like, for example, you know, in Topayo, you have, a, you have the, a shrine dedicated to a tree, right? Uh, and also, you know, there's also certain kinds of developmental history with a block of five uh, five room flat being used for the Southeast Asian Games in 1973 right? and, and at that time there were a lot of considerations like even the setting up of uh, NTUC 
there were, the, the setting of NDC was very conscious of where the provision shops are and so that they can set up the NTUC without disrupting the network of provision shops. Of course, now it's a completely different story. So, so in, in, in a sense, I think, the, uh, I, I, I think we, we should now also uh, go through and figure out, uh, as you said, right, 56 years is not a long time, but there, there is already so much complexity uh, and, and so many levels that perhaps if we can uh, pay a lot more, uh, pay a bit, a bit more attention to it, that, then I think it's also a very complex uh, and layered histories rather than you know uh, just lamenting on on, on loss. Uh, yeah. Prof, Prof was scribbling a lot of keywords. <laughs> Prof, you want to share with us what are some of the things that? Can Uh, I just want to say something that I really quite like about this exhibition. I, was, I think what Prof said earlier about how we find space in Singapore is very much as well. I don't see this as much, even though I've enjoyed the expressions. I also have to feel as if I've come here to witness a valuation space, like, like what you do at, at, at a property auction. Right? Because I think Singapore only understands space in terms such as property. Or leases, uh, because we there's no inherent value in this land. That there's nothing here that has holds any true value except for what it represents. And I like this exhibition and works for all similar theme exhibitions because they force you to reassess what is the value of space here. And whether it's happening in photography, whereby you see not just raw tree, but also this is a light novel. My favorite obviously are uh, you know, just curious. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at that, the particular piece is actually, I like it because I looked at the first time, I like, okay, SARS, Preston. Look at the second time, okay, I see MBS and me, and you know, small things like that. And it's just really, really accessible to think in the space because the that one is actually when I think about a new CE area, and I think about what we call wealth. Or high high value property now. It's it's a terrible water. That's why it is free. Really. Um, and, we <laughs> and we have to start looking at space space again, and not as a property, not as an investment, and to take away economic value because we know not going here is worth anything. But I enjoy it. Thank you guys. <laughs> So I, I, I was struck by the by the, the, the different perspectives on the, really the same theme, which is um, humanity and how public spaces and, and architecture um, is a re reflection of, of culture and humanity. And I think it's, it's really interesting to see how the three of you are using your imagination and, and projecting something that you're right, it, we all need to be very cognizant of the, the past and thinking about how we build a, a future that is connected to that past. So um, I, I agree with your comment that it's very well, or, this is a very well organized uh, exhibit as well because it's all, it is, it, the, the theme is very consistent. So, so thank you very much, enjoyed it. Hidaya? I mean, maybe, maybe, um, yeah. I mean, just to uh, take take this back a little bit because uh, this thing about um, value of space, you know, and how things organically start. Like, for example, Hidayah's um, children's book that won the Singapore Literature Prize uh, for for uh, it, it was the mango tree, and that book would not have been if the tree was not chopped down. So you know, it is like you lose something and then it gives birth to something else. So that book would not have been published if the tree was not chopped down. Of course, 
uh, it was chopped down because maybe somebody construed that it was taking up wasted space, right? But after that, um, I don't see the space being enhanced with anything more valuable than what that mango tree stood for Hidayah because that mango tree was planted by Hidayah's grandmother to commemorate her birth. So this valuation of space um, concept is very interesting because uh, what is valuable to you uh, of that item that takes up that footprint of that space may differ from what is valuable to the state, for example. So I, I, think, I, I thank you for, for commenting on this valuation of space. Um, and um, I think we are here connected because of the universal language of art. I'm not an artist, I don't hold a paintbrush, but I find that uh, from the photographs, from the digital art and the dripping of Jeffrey, there is a commonality in the universal language of art. And it acts also as a voice for non-artists like me. Like I cannot express myself through brush strokes, right? I, I can only maybe express myself through words. That's why I write. But um, we have to thank artists and photographers like, like you who can serve as a voice for the non-artists. So when I see a painting like the National Theatre or, or the National Stadium, I can immediately identify it. It's a wordless recognition of something that is um, meaningful in, in my lifetime. And it also acts as a voice for future, future generations. Like when you document histories of a place, you are surfacing that voice for future generations who may not have had the benefit of time and you know, uh, life experiences to experience what had been there. And therefore, when she can, like you, when you document and write your historical uh, narratives of that place, what has lived, what has been lost, uh, what has resurfaced in a very different form, you are actually serving as a voice for the benefit of future generations. So maybe at this point, I can check in with Mas, who is the curator of this exhibition, to share with us a few words. Okay. Um, uh, basically, when we, I mean, like what uh, Edmund said, we came together to show, um, you know, these artworks. Uh, it was based on conversations and how that uh, fin finally evolved into this exhibition and gladly into this art conversations. So, um, I will not say much because I think a lot has already been said. I mean, I'm grateful that we have all come together for this talk and um, uh, as it is, uh, I don't know whether we should be wrapping up. Yeah, yes, We've, yeah, we won't let you go, like what uh, Siausa has said. Yeah. No, I, I, I think the fact that the three artists in this exhibition are also ar architects of a particular generation and also being good friends uh, is quite significant. I think maybe Edmund, you said something to that effect, which is that as architects, you yourselves had to confront this, all these issues about time and space and about valuation and about disappearance of... of uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then the other thing about not being disheartened or depressed. You know, nowadays mental health is a great concern. So, certainly, um, all these radical changes uh, that we have all been experiencing and perhaps exacerbated uh, by, by the pandemic, uh, this, this quest for, for meaning, this quest to to find ourselves uh, in Hidayah's words, uh, all this take on extra dim uh, dimensions uh, which uh, we need to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so on, on that note, maybe we can wrap up this very fruitful session. Thank you for, for bearing with me and my organic composting and all that. But <laughs> I, I really want to pay tribute to the time and effort taken. Uh, I mean, it's a cosy setting and I'm glad we have come all together. 
socially distanced as we may be, but we are connected with our common um, passion for this topic. So thank you very much and thank you everyone for making time to be with us today.